lot of excitement about this topic. The two largest affiliations represented are from academics and from industry, but we have people all the way from PhDs and university professors to seventh grade science classes. So it's wonderful to have all of you with us. Over 20% of today's audience is from outside the United States. Our presenter today is Nathan Lewis. He's the George L. Argyros Professor of Chemistry at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. He's also the Scientific Director of the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis that's an energy innovation hub in fuels from sunlight. Professor Lewis received his PhD in Chemistry from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's been a full professor at Caltech since 1988. His research interests include photoelectrochemistry and vapor sensing. Among many awards, Professor Lewis received the Princeton Environmental Award in 2003. He's been an Alfred P. Sloan Fellow and a Camille and Henry Dreyfus Teacher Scholar, and he was a recipient of the American Chemical Society Award in Pure Chemistry. He has over 400 peer-reviewed publications, and he's mentored over 60 graduate students and postdoctoral scientists. He's also editor-in-chief of the, the journal Energy and Environmental Science. So with thanks, Professor Lewis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be there virtually, wherever you are, to tell you about what I think is one of the most exciting things that is before us as chemists to really try to develop something that the world really needs to provide both energy and environmental security all at once. Now, that technology is colloquially called artificial photosynthesis but it doesn't really look like a leaf, and it need not even share the exact blueprint of natural photosynthesis. So what it really is is the direct production, not indirect, through electricity of fuels from the biggest energy source known to man, the sun. I'd like to acknowledge, of course, support from the government agencies and private foundations that make this work possible the National Science Foundation's Center for Chemical Innovation on Solar Fuels was an early supporter of this work and also seed funding on the basic energy sciences from the DOE and the NSF. The Air Force Office of Scientific Research, part of this work was done as a core team under the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis supported by the Department of Energy and now more recently the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has been a participating partner in a significant way. The next slide really shows you the key here in that um, although we have photovoltaics and we have solar thermal power towers, there's a little problem in that if you want to build a clean energy system around the sun, it locally has this nasty little habit. goes out, last time I looked, every single night. And so he that cannot store shall not have power after four. Those high school kids and junior high school kids, you can quote that to your teacher if you write a report on this topic. And the real issue, how do you store that sunlight? Well, photovoltaics only provide electricity when the sun gives it to you and not when people need it. And we have no scalable way to store massive quantities of electricity other than what nature did, which has figured out that the best way to do it would be to store energy in chemical fuels like gas, coal, and oil that we burn upon demand whenever we need it for a higher energy density by a factor of 50 than the best battery and for a much longer period of time. Now, nature gets an A for inspiration, but a D minus for execution because if you take all the energy from the sun that hits an acre and the fastest growing plant and divide by all the energy that plant makes in all its forms, then you only get 1% efficiency at maximum is what the photosynthetic system does. Now, nature didn't optimize a plant to be an energy conversion machine. It's the wrong color. Solar cells are black. Plants are green. Their job is to reproduce and perform other functions, but it's not optimized for an energy conversion machine. And so our job is to get inspired by nature. But we don't build airplanes out of feathers, and so we're going to build our aircraft out of jet engines and aluminum or carbon fiber so that it flies faster and better than the natural system. 
and makes a fuel that we can use, not this lignocellulose stuff. The simplest fuel is to take water and sunlight and split that water into hydrogen and oxygen. Now that's got to be the first starting point, and it may be the end point because we can convert that hydrogen into ammonia for fertilizer. We can react it with carbon dioxide to make liquid fuels that are drop-in for transportation. Uh, but we could also think about a system that was closer to the exact photosynthetic system and fixed carbon dioxide in the air as well as water and made a liquid transportation fuel directly. That's a second level of development because it's much harder to reduce 400 parts per million of CO2 than it is liquid water from the sun. Now this works. This is a slide showing mineral, strontium titanate. When you shine ultraviolet light on it, it splits water quantitatively into hydrogen and oxygen. And this has been known, this so-called wireless system, since 1977, since we had a real energy crisis. And this spurred a lot of development in the ensuing period of time to find the magic material that we could plaster all over everybody's field and roof that would just make stored fuel from the sun. And what we found is that there are four things you want. You want it to be efficient, robust, cheap, and safe. And I can give you any two or maybe at most three, but not the fourth. Systems that are efficient and robust that last a long time make these co-evolved bubbles of hydrogen and oxygen. And any high school student knows this is a stunt because it will explode. And so you can't possibly build a system based on explosive gases that you'd be deployed globally. And so we have to go beyond the known materials. We could take a solar panel and then hook it up to an electrolyzer, but that costs way too much money. And so we would need to think about very cheap solar panels and very cheap electrolyzers that nobody yet knows how to make. The next slide shows you that nature has figured out a blueprint. Instead of one material, like that one strontium titanate, we use two materials. And the reason is you can hook them up like two batteries in series, like in a laser pointer, and use two lower energy photons, longer wavelengths of light, and add up the voltages to give you the voltage you need to split water. Because unlike photovoltaic, when if you make a little bit of current and a lot of voltage, or a little bit of voltage and a lot of current, power is just the product of V times I. But if you make a fuel, then I'm sure you know that to split water, you need a minimum voltage of 1.23 volts by the first law of thermodynamics. So if we get 1.22 volts, we get nothing. And therefore, we have to have this minimum voltage requirement. And the natural system does that by hooking together two chlorophylls so as to allow each one to absorb more into the visible region than in the ultraviolet. It also has other important parts of the blueprint. It has a catalyst to take water and make oxygen. That catalyst does this so-called four electron oxidation in a concerted, qualitatively efficient way. It's the source of all oxygen on our atmosphere. It also has a catalyst that does the reduction reaction to provide all the energy for a cell. It reduces ATP to ADP, reduces NADH. It makes, and it makes all the machinery of the cell work by photosynthesis. The oxygen evolving catalyst is not reductively stable, and the reducing catalysts are not oxidatively stable. And so nature separates them by a membrane to prevent back reaction and keep stability. Now that membrane also is needed for safety purposes to avoid that coevolution of the products. But it must pass protons, because if electrons move across the membrane, then by charge neutrality, protons also have to move. And so that's the natural blueprint of how nature's flying machine works. Two photosystems, a membrane, and two catalysts put together those five pieces, get them all working under the same conditions in the same way, and you should be able to make this thing fly. Well, we do that by a different inspiration. We want to use so-called hard materials, inorganic materials, that are not things found necessarily in the natural photosynthetic system, but are more stable and have the potential to be 10 to 20 times more efficient so as to not trade food for fuel. 
We also don't want to have those two photo absorbers be the same color like chlorophylls because they'll then fight for photons. Instead, we want one to be a blue absorber to get the high energy parts of the rainbow, the solar spectrum, leaving behind transmitting the red absorber for the bottom so it can capture them just as if we had a prism there. That's a much more efficient design. We want these to be rods like blades of grass on your lawn so we can have a long distance to absorb the light and then a short distance to move carriers sideways. We also want the catalyst to be disposed on these rods in a way that they won't block light, but will scatter photons into the structure and get them to be absorbed. Finally, we need a membrane to separate the products, and that membrane must pass protons. Because as you can see from this chemical reaction, when you oxidize water to make oxygen, you liberate protons. When you reduce anything but water to hydrogen and or carbon dioxide, you consume protons, and so you build up a pH gradient unless you pass protons. And you can see that this micro rod array has an internal sponge volume that lets the protons go down the shortest distance possible from where they are made to where they are consumed. And this is critical to avoid deleterious resistance losses because the protons in water are less mobile than the electrons and solids, and they're the slow step that drags the system down otherwise. So that's our blueprint as to how we're going to build a 747 instead of building this birds with feathers architecture to get this thing to fly. Now, after you have the idea, you have to then decide that I need an implementation, and this became a challenge for chemists that what I think will ultimately, when we build this system, be a triumph in materials by design. Because other than the cartoon, we didn't have any demonstration or materials that would function in this way, either individually or collectively, when we started this project in the mid-2000s because of the need for chemists to work on energy security in an environmentally sustainable and green way. So now I'm going to tell you the progress that we've made in various pieces of putting together this puzzle to make that vision become reality and to build a system that is like nothing else on our planet because it's not like a plant, it's not like a photovoltaic cell, and it has unique functions and functionality that we argue is something ultimately the world really needs to build a clean, sustainable energy system. So we have to grow these micro rods. We do this by this so-called vapor liquid solid growth method. We take little balls of metal catalysts and then we expose them to a silicon precursor in what is a toaster oven. It's a little more sophisticated than that. It's 1,000 degrees centigrade with mass flow controllers, but for all purposes at atmospheric pressure, it's just a tube furnace oven that contains our silicon precursor and wherever the silicon dissolves in these metal balls, it will then continue to dissolve until it supersaturates and then crystallizes. Now, we tried this, and there have been a thousand papers on growth of silicon nanowires, and all we got was felt. And we tried and tried for months, and that's all we got, and we rapidly then discovered the reason was that even though we laboriously patterned these metal dots on a silicon substrate in a perfect array by lithography. At growth temperature, after about 30 seconds, these balls all beat it up just like water droplets on your car. And that's called Oswald ripening. And so if that's really the pattern on the right that we start with, it should be no surprise we get a variety of different diameters and directions of the silicon that is grown. The way you isolate bamboo is you put a seed into a pot and you isolate it from the next pot. And that's what we did. We etch holes in an oxide of silicon. We then evaporate or electroplate the metal in those holes. We get the right amount of metal in there because we know the surface tension of the metal eutectic on the growing droplet of a silicon microwire. If we have too much at that growing droplet, then the metal will drip down the sides like wax down a candle and will grow filaments everywhere. If we have too little metal, it'll beat up on top and will grow filaments everywhere. But if we get it just right, the metal has nowhere to go, as you can see on the right. And then we put that in our toaster oven and we grow these beautiful single crystal microwire arrays of silicon on that substrate. 
Now, when we did this, not only was it interesting, but this problem was only starting because nobody in their right mind, although they're beautiful single crystals of silicon microwires that have been optimized in their spacing to reflect as little light as possible and scatter it internally, that these were contaminated by gold, which was in the growth process. And gold contaminated silicon has a very low lifetime so that the excited carriers can't move 200 microns, they can only move one or two. But this is fine for this structure because even though the photons of light can be absorbed all the way into the vertical extension of these micro rods, they don't have to go all the way up to the top like they would in a solar cell in order to be collected. They only need to move sideways by a micron by the diameter or in this case the radius of those micro wires. And so we can use very cheap material because they don't have to go all the way and the liquid is the perfect conformal contact to infiltrate this in a way that if you tried to make an ohmic electrical contact to such a device, it would be arguably manufacturably impossible. We showed that worked. We showed we could make good solar cells that could oxidize and reduce materials out of cheap silicon in this microwire array. But that would just be a stunt. It wouldn't look like the pieces that we needed in our architecture, except that then we put a piece of plastic in there. We do that with essentially a tube of fish tank goop that you could buy at the pet store. That's exactly where this one was bought. It's fish tank sealant called RTV, or chemically polydimethyl siloxane, which when you fill it up has this interesting property that if you peel it, the rate of its peeling affects its flexibility, much like a Band-Aid on hair. If you peel it very slowly, the polymer just comes off. You peel it very quickly, the polymer is stiff and the fibers come off with it. And so we give this a yank and rip off those fibers, and we make this material that has the micro rods embedded and still oriented in a piece of plastic that we can peel off and use as one of these pieces in our films. In addition, we end up, after we peel it, with the stubs of silicon in the microwire array that then we dissolve in a quick etch-in base and then put it back into the toaster oven after putting more catalyst down and then repeat the process. So this is like making money in a template when you take that expensive substrate and use it over and over again and the metal we have subsequently replaced from gold with nickel or even better with copper and we can plate that by an electroplating process, just like making a printed circuit board. And so we have a full cycle that allows us to make these micro rod arrays in a piece of plastic. And furthermore, as you see down below, it's not necessary that we fully embed the entire rod array with a polymer. We can only embed the bottom parts, or we can embed the bottom and then the middle with something else and then sacrificially dissolve the bottom after we flip it over and move that polymer up and down in the height to help us make essentially 3D electronics. Now in addition to that, we can do this with materials other than our TV, fish tank goop. And then we use those materials that conduct protons or hydroxide ions as made in fuel cells as the membrane to really build up a piece that looks like one of our target materials. Well, we need a catalyst. In our first catalyst to make water into hydrogen from silicon, we just decorated for demonstration purposes some platinum particles that you can see here on the side walls of this microwire array. Now, we don't want to use platinum in the end because it's too precious and expensive, and so we've replaced it with something else that I'll tell you about later. But just to demonstrate that we're on the right track, we started there. Another important point is that if we had a planar photovoltaic silicon cell, if we put enough platinum on there to be catalytically effective, it would have reflected like a metal or blocked all the light. But we don't have to worry about that in this structure because we can just decorate this with little specks of particles of platinum. As long as the photo-excited and absorbed carriers can find the platinum particle before they recombine, then we're good to go and they can catalyze the fuel formation by this architecture. We showed that worked. We published a paper in Science and another one in the Journal of the American Chemical Society demonstrating the implicit advantages of this part of the architecture for hydrogen production from sunlight by these microwire arrays.
But that isn't a whole system because that silicon can only reduce water to hydrogen. It can only provide us about half of a volt. And we need at minimum 1.23 volts, as I said, to split water by the first law of thermodynamics. And practically, you need more than that because you have over potential losses and resistance losses. So we can't do it even with two pieces of silicon, but we wanted to show we could make the structure anyway. So we made this full structure by instead of doing uh, expensive epitaxial growth, we made it like making a driver's license. We peeled an array and then we did it again, peeled another array, except that we add a little bit of bologna in our sandwich equivalent. We added a conducting organic polymer called P dot PSS because if electrons have to move from the top array to the bottom of the array and we're going to glue them together, then the rods are not necessarily aligned from the top to the bottom. And so we have to have a lateral conduction path. And that's what the P dot PSS performs the function of. Now it also turns out it makes an ohmic electrical contact to both N and P silicon. And we measured that and we've done some beautiful nanomechanical experiments like extracting teeth to understand the surface forces and binding of these wires that I'll defer for another time to discuss. This article of manufacture, this dual microwire array, really looks like our vision. It has all the characteristics. We've shown it prevents gas crossover. It passes protons or hydroxide, depending on the membrane. If it's a naphion membrane, it passes protons. If it's the alkaline equivalent, it passes hydroxide ions. It does everything except split water because silicon on the top is oxidatively unstable. And I already told you that two silicon electrodes still do not provide us sufficient voltage to do the chemical fuel formation that is mandatory for the system to work. So I've shown you that we can make these arrays and we can get all the functions we need except for that one magic material. And I'm going to tell you next how we've replaced the platinum and that magic material as another part of this materials by design project that faced us as chemists. To demonstrate that this worked, we took the microwire array and made a conformal self-aligned structure by abandoning the top and bottom just for expediency purposes and deposited by vapor deposition or other methods a layer of tungsten oxide as our second absorber on top of the silicon. That's our blue light absorber and the silicon's our red light absorber. By depositing it conformally in this way, we don't need that pesky little conducting polymer intermediate plane because the electrons on every wire have a clear shot to go from the top of the membrane to the bottom of the membrane. Tungsten oxide is also one of the few metal oxides that's stable in acid, and it was compatible with the silicon stability in acid and the membrane stability in acid. And so we believed that we could piece together a system which would actually be the first implementation successfully of this membrane-bound water splitting device. We did that. We published it. This device does work, but it's not very efficient, and we knew it wouldn't be efficient because the electronic band properties of tungsten oxide are misaligned with respect to optimal performance of the electrons with silicon. And for the aficionados, the band edge positions are not negative enough on tungsten oxide to actually support the efficient unassisted array along with its band gap. I'll tell you a little more how we've changed that scene with stabilizing entire classes of materials for this purpose later on. And this is an important photo, because if I didn't tell you what it looks like, the people in high school in biology might think that these were actually chloroplasts. They look a little too regular to be chloroplasts, but they really look like an artificial photosynthetic system where we have our chromophores, our pigments that are membrane embedded. The one on the left passes protons. The one on the right passes in the other direction hydroxides. These are real things that chemists have made that we brought literally to life here in a photosynthetic system that simply didn't exist before this materials by design project got into gear. Why do we care only about working in acidic or in alkaline in local media? Because we understand the laws of chemistry. As I alluded to, if you oxidize water to make oxygen, you're going to liberate protons. And if you consume by reduction those protons, then the local pH must go down. And you will end up with the pH gradient, 
from the site of oxidation to the site of reduction. If you don't have a membrane, you can neutralize the pH gradient, but you're back to where we started by co-evolving the explosive gases together, and that's simply too much of a safety hazard to ever see the light of day. When you put the membrane in, if it doesn't pass protons or hydroxide, you have no mechanism of neutralizing the pH gradient, and then the system will stop. And so you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can either build something that's efficient or something that's safe, but at neutral pH, you can't have both. And so we work under conditions where we can have it all, both efficiency, stability, and safety all at once. And that's critically important to us, of course, in a real system. Now we want to replace that platinum. In order to do that, we stood back as chemists and made a good turnout to be arguably lucky guess. We said that there's a chemical reaction class in refining catalysts at high temperature called hydrodesulfurization. And that those catalysts work, they take the hydrogen and sulfur out of feeds so that the catalysts that are used to refine oil are not poisoned by the sulfur in the system. And the way those catalysts work is believed to be that the intermediate is a surface-bound metal hydride, the species circled on that top left. Now that species, the surface-bound metal hydride that dissociates and then reforms hydrogen, is exactly the species that we believe will be the viable mechanistic route to reduce water at low temperature. Now there's no guarantee that the mechanisms and materials that work at high temperature for hydrodesulfurization will be good catalysts for low temperature hydrogen evolution, but we made a good educated guess that this would be a place that we would look. We collaborated with a synthetic nanomaterials chemist at Penn State, Raymond Schock, and his group made these nanomaterials, these nanoparticles, that had been predicted 10 years earlier, it turned out, by a theoretical chemist, Jose Rodriguez, based on the same analogy, he had predicted theoretically that they would be good hydrogen evolution catalysts. Indeed, they are some of the best non-noble metal hydrogen evolution catalysts. The overpotential needed, the energy loss to carry the solar photon flux, was much less than all other previous classes of these non-noble metals, and started to get low enough to approach platinum. We then took a lead and said, well, if nickel phosphide is an acid-stable, earth-abundant metal hydrogen evolution catalyst, what about other metal phosphides? We made cobalt phosphide. It was even better. We made iron phosphide. It was even better. And we published a series of papers of this nanomaterial synthesis by design. The reported best system is a blend between a metal sulfide and a metal phosphide by Tom Jaramillo's research group at Stanford that has shaved another 30 or 40 millivolts off of the cobalt and iron phosphide systems that has basically taken this entire class of compounds and shown that we don't need to use the platinum. And so if we need to get to global scale, we've broken that precious metal barrier on the water reduction side. We have not, however, replaced the iridium oxide on the water oxidation side, and we would dearly love to do that. If there are good ideas out there, please email me so we can test those materials in our system. Based on these low overpotential earth abundant catalysts for the hydrogen evolution reaction, we can take advantage of another feature of the microwire array, and that is uh, that the photon flux from the sun on a planar surface has to pass the corresponding set of charges back through the entire plane. But as you can see in the right, in the lower panel, on a microwire array, that same solar photon flux produces a much lower catalyst demand because the flux is distributed across the internal area and volume of the microwire array instead of being forced to come up through the projected area of the sample. This leads to a factor of 100 decrease in the catalyst turnover for a microwire array as a requirement relative to a planar sample. In addition, for a fuel cell or an electrocatalyst that's working in an electrolysis system, the current density demands are in the order of one amp per centimeter squared, whereas they're 100 fold less, 10 million per centimeter squared, for the solar photon flux. 
those two factors of 100 relax the catalyst activity requirements so that we need not have as active catalysts for the hydrogen evolution reaction to be kinetically competent in the solar fuel system as we would in other applications. To demonstrate this, the next slide shows that we have placed nickel molybdenum, which is not as active as platinum on a per site basis, in sufficient mass loading, but at the base of the microwire arrays, where instead of blocking light, they reflect light back into the structure along with a titanium dioxide scattering layer to serve as an optical scattering and light management system. And we've shown that by using this three-dimensional architecture that we can obviate the need for noble metal catalysts for the hydrogen evolution reaction and instead use non-precious metal catalysts for the same effect and same efficiency in these systems. The next slide shows how much there is to be gained by further changes in the electrocatalyst over potential. It was performed by the benchmarking group in the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis and shows that the hot zone, so-called, these shaded squares in the lower left corner of these plots, which each represent on the x-axis the activity, the overpotential, where lower is more active as a function of the initial time of measurement, and then on the y-axis, the same quantity two hours later to give an indication of stability. Hence, a stable and active catalyst would lie on that 45-degree angle trajectory and be near the origin. And you can see that for the hydrogen evolution catalyst, we already have adequate active systems in both acidic and in alkaline media where safe and efficient solar fuels generators can be built. On the other hand, in alkaline media for the oxygen evolution reaction, we have a whole variety of water oxidation catalysts. We still seek, however, to have water oxidation catalysts that would replace the scarce iridium oxide which is the only stable, earth-abundant or not, metal catalyst for the water oxidation system under acidic conditions. Because we have this established, we can then ask the question of how much of an improvement in the catalyst performance would make a corresponding difference in the efficiency of an ultimate system that we would build to generate fuel from sunlight. What we've done is a sensitivity analysis. And on that sensitivity analysis, we've actually said in a one-factor-at-a-time analysis where we need to be in order to try to get the maximum efficiency out of our systems. What makes the biggest difference from where we are now? And what we've shown is no matter which curve you're on, that increasing the catalytic activity by another 50 millivolts, going a little more to the left, will barely make a difference in efficiency and what makes the most difference is matching up these light absorbers. And so we set our efforts to try to match up the light absorbers to remediate that deficiency that we had with tungsten oxide being the only good material we had but not good enough. In order to do that, we went back 20 years or more to a discovery made for another reason at Intel. TiO2 is the ingredient used in sunscreen, and it's a blocking layer, but that blocking layer is not supposed to pass holes or electrons because it's insulating. We inadvertently deposited by atomic layer deposition that TiO2 on top of a silicon substrate and found that it was not insulating, that it passed light but let electrons and holes go through the material. And indeed, it passed a lot of current while protecting that underlying silicon from oxidation. Now, Chris Chidsey and Paul McIntyre had done this by atomic layer deposition a year or two earlier with TiO2 in a very thin nanometer layer tunneling barrier, but it found the thicker layers in the way they made it block electrons, and we wanted to use thick protective films in order to get conformality and robustness and found that they passed electrons and let silicon, which was oxidatively susceptible 
to water oxidation in the sunlight to oxide, instead oxidize water to molecular oxygen photochemically for hundreds of hours. We then applied this to gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide phosphide, and showed we could stabilize the entire class of small band gap semiconducting materials that had heretofore been off the table, thought to be fundamentally inaccessible since 1955 when Gerisher first found that they corroded. Now this system works best on materials that passivate. Because if you ever get a pinhole or a defect, then it's like rusting a car. So if you're actively corroding, like gallium arsenide, we need a different strategy than this in order to maintain stability for thousands of hours. We've implemented one and are about to submit a successful demonstration of that as well. But in the case of silicon, we have this self-healing array where if we have a scratch in the coating or a pinhole, it oxidizes a little bit there, but it doesn't propagate the defect because it passivates. And those are the kinds of materials like these silicon microwire arrays that are the best suited to this protection scheme that lets these materials be our missing piece in the top part of the puzzle. We then showed that this could work in an entire system. We took a 3-5 base system that had a dual array of two emitters and one absorber. They were matched like D-cell batteries in series. We have the membrane, in this case not fully integrated, just side by side. We show we can pass hydroxide across the membrane. We show we can photoactively make this system not co-evolve gases, but quantitatively form hydrogen and oxygen in a safe way at greater than 10% efficiency, stable for hundreds of hours. We understand that at the macro scale that the stability will be undercut by a defect or a pinhole and are devising strategies to successfully mitigate against that that will extend these materials to thousands of hours. And so now we have pieces. We have the top absorber, we have the bottom absorber, we have the membrane, we have the catalysts. In basic media, we use different materials. We use nickel and nickel molybdenum on the cathode, and we use nickel iron hydroxide on the anode. In order to set up a system that will actually deliver the vision of putting the pieces together, in order to make fuel directly from the sun. Now this first system is not the last system. It's going to be a platform to make it faster, better, cheaper, and to fix problems that we know are problems and not ones that we don't. We would dearly like to get a catalyst in that also reduces CO2 to a liquid fuel, but as I said earlier, that may well need a concentrated source of CO2 and we may be better off pumping the electrons or the hydrogen to that source as opposed to fixing it right up front, either way would be a success. And so we're pursuing both paths in parallel instead of trying to put all our eggs in one basket as part of our research program that's really broadly based to try to develop the underlying chemistry to make these materials by design function in this important way. Finally, of course, we're an ACS symposium, and our job is to train future uh, leaders in the ACS more than anything else. That's my research group's photo there. Uh, they do all the work. They are the best group of people you could ever ask to have, and it's nothing short of or just wonderful to be involved with them every single day. And so I owe a lot to them and would definitely like to acknowledge them all by name if I had the time to do so in this seminar. Nathan, there's a lot of questions pouring in here. So let me combine about three different questions into one. Please discuss some of the major obstacles that are remaining to an actual large-scale semi-commercial feasibility study with respect to what you're doing. The remaining obstacles are that we need the combination of the materials that all function at the same time in the same place and they all have to work together. Now we think we're pretty close to that uh, as a first demonstration, but we're very cognizant that this first demonstration is much more like the Wright brothers. It will show we can fly, but it's not in a form yet uh, that is going to be scalable, manufacturable, and easily transitioned into the startup company that's going to have them on everybody's roofs in five years. We have implementation 
and innovation in order to go from here to get to that point. Um, we would dearly love to pursue that, but we have to have the resources and commitment of the people that fund this in order to do that transition. And that so-called valley of death is very difficult for energy. So we're, we're doing our job to try to get the proof of concept and go from there. Thank you. We've got a question here from Hari Prasad. What are the major hurdles that are associated with direct photocatalytic conversion of carbon dioxide into fuels and fine chemicals? Water splitting is much easier to do than carbon dioxide direct reduction. I've told you the hurdles in water splitting, and that's a big enough job, but if we want to layer on top of that the direct reduction of carbon dioxide to a liquid fuel, then we have to find unprecedented families of catalysts that reduce carbon dioxide selectively and efficiently to a targeted liquid fuel by six or more electrons as opposed to the two electron reduction of water. They have to do that in the presence of air and oxygen, which is much higher in concentration than the CO2. And we're going to have to find a way to concentrate and suck that CO2 to the reaction sites and not get it be depleted. And so it may well be that we'd rather provide the hydrogen to a concentrated CO2 site, maybe even from plants that are the absorbers of CO2 and uptake it and upgrade biofuels as opposed to doing it directly in a large area system. But technical hurdles are the catalysts, the absorbers, the absorbing of the CO2, and the oxygen and water in the air that aren't always our friends. Okay, very good. Um, we have another question from Alicia in Poland and, and also from China. Water oxidation is a four electron process. It's much more difficult than the reduction end. What do you think is the direction of the research in this field? For water oxidation, there are, in my view, two directions. One is uh, that we would dearly appreciate earth abundant water oxidation catalysts that could replace iridium oxide for scalability and stability in acid media. Essentially what we're asking for is a noble non-precious metal that may well be an oxymoron but there's no reason noble metals are of course chemically defined as the metals that are stable under extraordinarily oxidative conditions in an aqueous environment but they don't have to be precious metals in order to satisfy the nobility criterion and so if we had a noble non-precious electrocatalyst for the water oxidation reaction that would be important. We don't see any role for near neutral pH stable water oxidation catalysts because we can't build an efficient safe system there. It would be helpful to get replacements that are lower and over potential for water oxidation and alkaline media but it's only incremental because the catalysts we have, the iron nickel oxyhydroxides are already pretty good. If we shaved another 100 millivolts of overpotential off, we would do a little bit better. And so that would be a good step, but it's not the big lever. The big lever is the light absorbers from where we are now. Great. Thank you. Now, Daniel Evangelista is one of several people who are asking for you to discuss a little bit more about hydroxide rather than H plus and redox. I think the, actually the question is more of what, what are the leads, what's the best leads in working in hydroxide and alkaline media rather than acidic? Oh, perfect. Thank you. So I did allude to that. In alkaline media, we have already earth abundant catalysts for the cathode and nickel molybdenum lasts for seven years, low over potential. And we have iron nickel oxyhydroxide lasts for a long period of time. They're used in commercial electrolysis. And we've shown that we have strategies to put those absorbing materials at bases of microwire arrays where they'll not be deleterious absorption or reflection. We think we can use them pretty much as is. In basic media, we've stabilized the materials that passivate and believe we have a strategy that will let us get good long-term stability on materials that actively corrode. And so we have a lot of materials like gallium arsenide phosphide now and the three and the two six group materials for the anodes. Um, that missing cathode 
in basic media, we're looking at layered materials like tungsten diselenide and molybdenum sulfide and other 2D materials to serve as the cathode because they're not etchable in base, unlike silicon. And so that would be our preferred combination. And we already have membranes that are pretty good for hydroxide conduction. So those are the cards we would bring to that table to put an entire system together successfully. Great. Now, now we have a very specific question from Krista Van Oversteeg. She's asking, what's your opinion on semiconductor nanocrystals for photocatalytic water splitting? So the semiconductor nanocrystals are practiced as an alternate pathway uh, around by many research groups, including Domen's research group in Japan is predominant there. People in Europe and Spain are working on this system and also to some extent the United States. They have promise in that they could be the most cost-effective way to make a photocatalytic reaction vessel occur. The problematic issues, however, being faced by the Japanese consortium are the ones I alluded to that is on a particle slurry you are inherently going to produce explosive mixtures of hydrogen and oxygen over active catalysts for their recombination in the presence of light and heat. And so unless very clever strategies are designed to somehow separate those gases from their incipient production form, there's always going to be an explosive safety hazard associated with that kind of reactor that may well serve as a showstopper. So we need to address that. There are some flow reaction schemes that Frank Osterloh and Bruce Parkinson are proposing that are interesting. Eric McFarland is working on some interesting systems and many others. I think they're very interesting chemically and scientifically. It's a question of can we work through this engineering hurdle of the safety or not in those systems. Great. Charlene Jeff is asking, what's the cost and what are the major objectives that you would need to demonstrate in a feasibility test prototype for a commercial product? The cost and the cost analysis in perspective is, I think, best dealt with by referring you to a, and the readers to a review article that just appeared last month that I authored in Science Magazine that goes through the current landscape of solar electricity, solar thermal, and solar fuels. For solar fuels, the competition is A, we already, in principle, have a photovoltaic cell that could be hooked up to an electrolysis unit. So we serve the similar identical function in some cases, and therefore the only way to compete would be on a cost basis. None of these systems, including solar electricity and photovoltaics, are cost-effective routes to hydrogen now compared to the way it's made from steam reforming of natural gas. So we're only really looking at this as in the future when we have a carbon-constrained world and have to store sunlight on large scale. Now that being said, we think everything has the potential to be cheap because this is just a rollable piece of plastic and it's got a membrane and it looks more like a high-performance rain jacket than it does a solar panel with the efficiencies of solar panels, but with the architecture that looks more like artificial turf installations. To get to that cost point, we would need a manufacturing industry and prototypes that warranted that level of scale and get it out of the lab. And we're not in a position yet to have demonstrated the science to cross that valley of death, um, but we're hopeful we can get there. Great. Now, I'm going to read you part of a pretty long question from Daryush Terajad. Uh, the basis of the question is, um, what about manganese compounds? Manganese compounds are getting a lot of attention for the four electron oxidation of water because, of course, they're the basis, as far as we know, for the natural photosynthetic oxygen evolving complex. They are problematic in the form of oxodimers and precipitates of manganese when one works in locally acidic or locally alkaline media. And so we're going to have to find strategies to accommodate systems under which we can build efficient but safe and stable systems at the same time. Just because nature flies with feathers doesn't mean we want to build our aircraft that way. 
and the natural photosynthetic system is not optimized for efficiency, nature does other things with that pH gradient. It uses it to make and break chemical bonds. And so every piece there has a role, and we'd like to not have to duplicate the whole set of pieces to make a different system that performs our function faster, better, and cheaper than the natural one. Okay, I, th I think we probably have time for one or perhaps two more questions. One from Alyssa Rosas is, is, what's the current density at 500 millivolts over potential for the entire cell? That's a very good question. So right now in alkaline media, the current density at 10 millimeters per centimeter squared for the water oxidation catalysts are about 320 millivolts. And for the hydrogen evolving catalysts are under 100. So keeping score, we'll call that 400, and we keep IR drops in our system design down below 100. So we're 500 millivolts total over potential in our system, and that was validated in that solar to hydrogen 10% efficient system that we built and constructed. So the modeling and simulation, individual pieces, and actual measurements are in agreement that we can hold that to about 500 and we have the potential then with that 500 millivolt over potential loss and better match light absorbers to build a 20% efficient system and so that's the the tack that is the most promising approach at least at the present time in alkaline media. Okay, excellent. And I'm going to follow that up with a related question from Mahmoud Amin. What's the efficiency of the cell compared to the chemical hydrogen fuel cells? The efficiency of a biological system is less than 1%. In fact, that's only at the photosynthetic level. The whole organism plant level is barely even a few tenths of a percent on a total solar end to hydrogen or to fuel free energy out in natural photosynthetic systems. Our solar to measured lower heating value free energy of hydrogen production where we take a good solar simulator and measure all of its intensity and then measure all the lower heating value or free delta G energy content in the hydrogen we produce is over 10% in these systems. So a factor of better than 10 that really enables you to start thinking about not worrying about trading food for fuel because the land area constraints are so much relaxed by that big order of magnitude reduction in land area coverage. Nathan, I'm going to have to apologize to you and to the whole audience because it's going to take us another hour if we go through all of the questions that are pouring in here. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to wrap us up with a, a few key thoughts to take away from today's presentation and with a big thank you from all of us. First of all, progress has been remarkable. We went 100 years without a change in hydrogen evolution activity. We broke through that barrier in a year or two with a concerted effort. We went 50 years without stabilizing inorganic semiconductors, and we stabilized all of them essentially for hundreds of hours at least within a year period of time. This is a tremendous opportunity for chemists and material scientists to get excited about a problem that you argue and I argue the world really needs our service to try to solve in the one chance we have to do it and I would encourage everybody to think hard about doing this in the future that we have available to deliver this promise to the world ahead of us. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service by the American Chemical Society as your professional source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.